empirical evidence suggests that money is not as neutral as predicted by our equilibrium business cycle model. The price misperceptions model provides a possible explanation for the non-neutrality of money. Households sometimes misinterpret changes in nominal prices and wage rates as changes in relative prices and real wage rates. The important difference from before is that households have incomplete current information about prices in the economy. The price level P, the relevant variable, is the price of a market basket of goods. These goods will be purchased from many locations at various times. Therefore, a worker will typically lack good current information about some of these prices. Denote by PE the price that a worker expects to pay for a market basket of goods. What happens when workers do not understand that an increase in the nominal wage rate W stems from a monetary expansion that inflates all nominal values, including the price level, P. Each worker may think instead that the rise in W constitutes an increase in his or her real wage rate W over P. The perceived real wage rate is the ratio of W to the expected price level, PE. This ratio, W over PE, rises if the expected price level, PE, increases proportionally by less than W. If W over PE increases, the worker increases the quantity of labor supply, LS, again assuming leisure to be a normal good, and thus, when its price increases, that is the real wage, households will have less of it. We can now look at this figure to better understand this. A rise in the actual price P versus the perceived price PE for supplies of labor, that is the employees, raises the perceived real wage W over PE for a given real wage W over P. Therefore, the labor supply curve shifts to the right from LS to LS prime. We conclude that unperceived inflation raises labor input and lowers the real wage rate. The rise in labor input, L, will lead to an expansion of production, that is, real GDP, Y, increases in accordance with the production function we had from before. The difference between the long run and the short run in the price misperceptions model is that the expected price level, PE, adjusts towards the actual price level, P, in the long run. We conclude that the effects of an increase in the nominal quantity of money, M, on these real variables are only temporary. In the long run, an increase in M leaves the real variables unchanged. The price level P and the nominal wage rate W rise by the same proportion as the increase in M. We conclude that in the long run, money is still neutral. Looking at the time paths for perceived inflation and output, we see that in the short run, unperceived inflation leads households to believe in a real wage increase. Consequently, you observe an increase in labor supply and consequently an increase in output. As time passes, households' perceptions converge with the actual price movements and the expansionary impact on output is reversed. One important conclusion from the price misperceptions model is that only unperceived changes in the price level P affect labor input L and real GDP Y. The Lucas hypothesis on monetary shocks is that the real effect of a given size monetary shock is larger the more stable the underlying monetary environment, as the opportunity cost of tracking inflation is smaller and thus it is easier to inflation to go by unperceived, which has some empirical support. Now we can use the price misperceptions model to get alternative predictions of cyclical patterns for macroeconomic variables. In this analysis, we imagine that economic fluctuations result from monetary shocks, that is, exogenous variations in the nominal quantity of money, M, to assess the empirical plausibility of this being a dominant force in business cycle fluctuations. This table summarizes co-movements between different aggregates and output for both frameworks. First, our original equilibrium business cycle model with TFP shocks, and then the price misperceptions model with monetary shocks. The observed patterns in the data are also included. Let's start by reviewing the equilibrium business cycle dynamics with TFP shocks. An increase in TFP leads output to increase. This increase in output will increase the real demand for money and drive down the price level. Assume the central bank tries to stabilize prices. 
many supply will go up in response. Thus, the nominal quantity of money is procyclical and the price level countercyclical. Both seem to have, at least some, empirical backing. What about the behavior of the real wage and labor input? The increase in total factor productivity leads to a shift in the demand for labor, leading to an increase along the labor supply curve, making labor pro-cyclical. Lastly, because the original shock is an increase in total factor productivity, it is easy to conclude that the average labor productivity increases, as it seems to be at least somewhat in the data. Let's now focus on the predictions of the price misperceptions model. We just found that an increase in money supply in this framework will lead to an increase in output. Hence, money is procyclical. What about the price level? Well, in response to the increase in money supply, prices will increase along the money demand schedule to a higher equilibrium price level, thus making prices procyclical, something we do not observe in the data. Labor input is also procyclical in accordance with the data. Unperceived inflation leads to the misperceptions that the real wage increased and households increase labor supply, leading to a lower real wage rate in equilibrium. While the increase in labor supply in expansions is backed by the data, the decrease in real wages is not. Lastly, it is easy also to show that the average product of labor in this setting is also countercyclical. Since there are decreasing returns to labor, the increase in labor supply while holding capital fixed must lead to lower productivity. This is also at odds with the data. So, all in all, what we get from this is that the price misperceptions mechanism doesn't seem to be a promising explanation for business cycle fluctuations, although it provides a rationale for why monetary shocks are neutral as predicted by the equilibrium business cycle model. It is maybe time for us to review some empirical evidence on the real effect of monetary shocks. The classical reference is Friedman and Schwartz's monetary history book. The authors analyzed U.S. monetary policy from 1867 to 1960. Later on, the same authors also performed a similar analysis to the U.K. from 1875 to 1975. Their research considered, first, the historical sources of changes in the nominal quantity of money, and, second, the interactions of these changes with variations in economic activity. Their main conclusions were that, first, changes in behavior of the money stock have been closely associated with changes in economic activity, money income, and prices. Second, that the interrelation between monetary and economic change has been highly stable. And third, that monetary changes often had an independent origin. They have not been simply a reflection of changes in economic activity. The first two points are essentially a statement that nominal monetary aggregates are pro-cyclical. The most important point, however, is their third one, the statement that the pro-cyclical pattern for monetary aggregates cannot be explained entirely by endogenous responses to economic activity. This provides evidence that indeed money is not neutral, at least not in the short run. The attempt to isolate monetary shocks that could be deemed exogenous to economic activity is motivated by the quasi-natural experiment literature that we have alluded at the beginning of the course. The goal of identifying the causal impact of money supply on economic activity requires more sophisticated analysis than just looking at correlations. For example, Christina Romer and David Romer in 2003 attempt to isolate exogenous monetary shocks by looking at changes during meetings of the Federal Reserve's Federal Open Market Committee in the target for the federal funds rate. At this point, the empirical evidence suggests that positive monetary shocks tend to expand the real economy, whereas negative monetary shocks tend to contract the real economy. However, the evidence is not 100% conclusive, and we surely lack reliable estimates of the strength of this relationship. So far, we found the misperceptions model to be more of a mechanism that provides a rationale for the non-neutral effects of monetary policy than something relevant to explain business cycles as a consequence of monetary shocks. 
But if total factor productivity shocks still remain the most promising source of business cycle fluctuations, how would a TFP shock look like in this environment? Well, an increase in TFP raises real GDP, but lowers the price level, more so if the monetary authority does not respond to stabilized prices. So in an expansion, when prices fall, perceived prices decrease by less. Hence, workers overestimate the price level in an expansion. This overestimate means that workers underestimate their real wage rate increase, and labor supply won't respond as much in this environment. Let's repeat this experiment by looking at the following figure. The technology level A rises from A to A prime. The labor demand ships upward, as now, at any wage rate, the quantity of labor demanded is higher than initially. Since the increase in A also reduces the price level, P, price misperceptions will lead to a contraction of labor supply, from LSA to LSA prime. The increase in labor, here depicted as moving from L star to L star prime, is thus smaller than if it there were no price misperceptions. Therefore, price misperceptions lessen the response of labor to a technology shock. Another point worth taking is that the information asymmetry created by the possibility of unanticipated monetary shocks between the monetary authority and households opens the door to strategic behavior. It is not surprising that monetary authorities would be tempted to exercise their power to create money shocks as a way to influence real variables. However, economists have found that such temptations can lead to bad economic outcomes. The reason for the bad results involved the distinction between rules and discretion. Under a monetary rule, the central bank commits itself to a designated mode of conducting monetary policy. Under discretion, the authority leaves open the possibility for surprises, that is, for monetary shocks. For given inflationary expectations, pi e, the monetary authority faces a trade-off when considering whether to use its policy instruments to raise the inflation rate, pi. An increase in pi is beneficial because it raises the inflation surprise and thereby expands real GDP, y, and labor input, l. But the monetary authority doesn't like inflation in its own sake since it weakens prices and markets' ability to channel resources to their most efficient uses. Let's assume that as a consequence of the trade-off, the policymakers make optimal choice of inflation, pi hat, to be a function of household inflation expectations. This is given by the dark blue line in this figure. To get the intuition, imagine that inflation expectations are zero. Then it is very tempting for the monetary authority to create surprise inflation, since it can increase real activity at the small cost of little inflation. However, soon expectations will pick up, and the monetary authority, to keep stimulating the economy, needs to create additional surprise inflation. The slope of pi hat is below 1, because additional inflation is costly. In the long run, it is not possible to systematically surprise households, so in the long run the only equilibrium is given by when expectations, pi e, match the actual inflation rate, pi hat given by the 45 degree line. The unappealing aspect of this equilibrium is that it entails a high inflation rate without any of the benefits that come from surprisingly high inflation, since expectations match actual inflation rates. This is an outcome to be expected under discretionary policy. This equilibrium prevails if the monetary authority cannot, or at least does not, make commitments about future monetary actions. In contrast, an authority that makes such commitments is viewed as operating under an explicit or implicit policy rule. One simple form of rule commits the monetary policy authority to adjust its instruments to approximate price stability to set the target inflation rate to zero or some small number. Central banks in most advanced economies have become committed to low and stable inflation. In many countries, the commitments are reinforced by formal provisions stipulating that the central bank's objective is price stability. With increasing frequency, this objective is stated in terms of inflation targeting. The European Central Bank, for example, specifically sets 
2% as the inflation target in the euro area for purposes of conducting monetary policy. 